over 70 countries in the world have anti-homosexuality laws. Now, this means that in some countries, loving someone of the same sex could either land you in prison or even cost you your life. Now, in Kenya, the LGBTQ community has constantly pushed against repressive laws that some have termed relics of colonial times. However, in 2018, the gay and human rights groups had a big win when the High Court outlawed anal exams. Now, these are some intrusive medical tests that would be carried out when someone was suspected to be gay. Following that win, activists partnered together to repeal a law that punishes same-sex relations in Kenya with up to 14 years. So how does one live in a society that barely tolerates them? On the show today, we have Brian Masharia, who's a communications officer at the Gay and Lesbian Coalition in Kenya. Brian, welcome so much to the show. Thank you very much. How was it like growing up as a gay person in Kenya? People who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and non-binary um, experience a multitude of you know challenges in different spheres um, there is what is you know real I, you know identity where a person legitimately and publicly identifies as a member of the LGBTQ community and there are those who are perceived to be LGBTQ community to be members of the LGBTQ community either be it from uh, engaging in media representation and media correspondence such as this, or just people who, um, you know, you walk a certain way, you talk a certain way, you have physical gestures and gender expressions that do not conform or are kind of in conflict with the body that you have. So say you you have a, you're a man, you look like a man with beards and yet you have a feminine gestures, then people will very automatically um, assume um, that you are a member of the LGBTQ community and therefore immediately resort to violence and um, you know, stigma and discrimination. How was it for you to come out to your parents, to your schoolmates? I was forced. I was forced. I didn't just sit somewhere in a corner and I'm just like, yeah, Brian, you're going to go and tell the world um, about how colorfully gay and proudly gay you are. No, that wasn't then because I hadn't achieved that level of self-affirmation at the time. I was still very unaware. I didn't know whether there was a, an LGBTQ community in Kenya. I felt like I was the only one in the world in Kenya. So I was very, you know, conservative. I tried to keep this as quiet as I could. But my gender expression is a completely different thing, something I have little control over. So because of that, People quickly just picked up, you know, how different I was, how di how my gender expression didn't conform to the stereotypes of, you know, gender expression. And so because of that, I was a target. Um, and so any little thing I did was constantly under scrutiny because it could stand out. And um, Around how old were you when you noticed this, uh, that you were the target? Um, it started about two years ago, like when I was 16. Um, there was a trigger when I was, in, when I was 16 years old, um, but it quieted down over a couple of months. And um, for the better part of my 17 years, for the better part of when I was 17, I was very, you know, very, very conservative, very quiet, trying not to engage with boys, trying not to attract any unnecessary attention until something, another trigger happened um, when I was just about to get to my 18, 18th birthday. And that is when, that was the camel, that was the stroke that broke the camel's back. What happened? And, well, uh, so I was, I was in, I, I had a, I had a thing, I had a relationship with this uh, boy in high school. Um, we'd write each other little notes, communicating with each other, living each other meeting today, how's your day, how are you doing, you know, things. Uh, so one of the letters I wrote fell into the wrong hands. It's like someone spotted me writing it before I even finished. And though I didn't send it, 
I kept it just securely in a particular place. A couple of people had spotted it and they were they had followed it. So when I left and I went to do other things, this guys broke into my locker, found the letter, and yeah, it became a thing because they shared it with people, they shared it with people, and the school in just a couple of hours grew restless over this alleged love letter between two boys, um, and that caused. Uh, called the attention of that school administration. Um, and, you know, once it got to the school administration, it became, you know, it became a suspension issue. So I got suspended the following day. Um, and How I did was your parents told, react when you came home well, from... Well, my, my mother... Well, my mother... My, my, my father wasn't around at the time. So that wasn't a, an issue. Um, so I had to deal with my mother and my elder brother. So when I went home and I told my mother that I was suspended, obviously I could tell the tension because I grew up in a very strict background. Um, expectations of success and, you know, steadiness and, you know, just, you know, being an exemplary child was so high. So when anything that shook those expectations, it was problematic. Um, she did not take it very well. She asked me to go stay with my grandmother because she didn't feel comfortable with me staying in the house by myself during the day. Um, when, when she finally got comfortable with having me around, um, she called cops, they staged an arrest. There. Yes, 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 police in, in casual wear, in civilian wear, um, got arrested. We had our help in the house and my grandmother's house was also gay and he was also arrested um, because my parents perceived that he was the one who indoctrinated me into homosexuality which was completely different which was completely false we got to the police station um and yeah so, so, <laughs> so your parents were okay with having a help who was homosexual but not having their son as a as a homosexual person for some reason, yeah, because the help was doing a lot of work in the house. But they, they were okay with having him around, but they were, they were not okay with him uh, teaching me how to be homosexual because that is what they thought. They thought I'm only gay because I learned it from the help. And I'm like, no, like, he's been, he's been here for like two years and I have been gay my entire life. Could you tell us a little more about this petition? Or about the laws specifically? Um, so Kenya, like many other countries that have been colonized by the British, um, inherited a set of uh, laws um, that criminalize carnal knowledge against the order of nature, which in, in essence is uh, punishing any type of unnatural sex. Um, any sex that is not leading to procreation is considered unnatural and therefore punishable by up to 14 years according to the laws of Kenya. We're trying to, to make it clear to the Kenyan population that these are laws that apply to all Kenyan. Anyone who identifies as Kenyan um, in Kenyan soil can be prosecuted based on these sections of the penal code. However, that is not the case. Um, the case that we see right now is these laws have been used um, incessantly, to, incessantly to oppress and violate the human rights of people who identify as LGBTQ in Kenya. As the LGBTQ community in Kenya continues to push for change, what do some Kenyans think of these laws? Let's take a listen. Such a fundamental decision should not just be left for the High Court of Kenya or for our judicial system to decide. Now I believe we are having a referendum very soon and uh, if so be it, then uh, I feel this should be a fundamental question in the plebiscite. Now Brian, the next question is related to what he says. Do ordinary people even know about this law? We feel that um, there is a little bit of, you know, um, misinformation um, from the general public. Um, our political elites um, have made enormous efforts to create a perception that, you know, these laws exist and they are only 
uh, they only exist to punish um, unnatural sex. They only exist to punish identities that are not uh, straight. Now, an interesting report by Amnesty Group says that women-to-women -women marriages have been documented in over 40 ethnic groups in Africa. That's including Nigeria, Kenya, South Sudan. But even with a long cultural background, many families still have a problem with homosexuality. Let's take a look at this tweet by June Eric Odwari, a UK activist with Nigerian roots. She openly identifies as a black lesbian woman, and this is how her mother reacts to her. June, in Muslim countries, they kill people for being lesbian. It just means you can't find a man to love you. Now, the mother continues to write, I will completely disown you and sue you until you stop using the, the name Eric Odwari. Now, let's take a listen to what people in Nairobi are saying. Would they disown their families if they came out to them as homosexual persons? I will disown him, him or her. I don't care. I don't care what you say. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're my brother or who. I would disown my family member if they came out to me. How common are this? Uh, how common is this rhetoric? Indeed, a lot of parents um, have this sentiment, but this is a sentiment that is uh, stemming from a place of misinformation. It is a sentiment that is stemming from a place of fear. It is stemming, it is, it is a sentiment that is stemming from a place of um, uncertainty and the fear of the unknown. Thank you very much, Brian, for joining us and shedding light on this significant repeal in Kenya. Now, if you would like to watch this video or more like this that we have on the show, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification button below. That way, you will know what's up on what happened next. Till next time, goodbye.